so is your word, Lord. Please come like heaven and do hmm. and make our spiritual land be fruitful, Lord. May you continue also use your mighty hand and tender hand, Lord, to to pull out the roots of those things that are worldly, carnal, selfish, or self-centered, Lord. Sometimes even deceptive, Lord. So as you continue, as Noah's vision and John's vision recently said, spare us from the scheme, the devil, Lord. Hmm. Give us weaponry. Give us wisdom. Hmm. Give us uh, courage. The world come, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray for for your spiritual covering over us, Lord, that the word can be so misused. But we know it is so real, so true, Lord. We need your tent. We need your garment over us, Lord. We need your headship over us. So today, hmm. I pray for young heart, young minds, <clears throat> in the chaos of the world, in all those exasperating noises, Lord, as if we had to choose a side, had to do this, had an opinion, Lord, I pray to be dialed out, and your gentle, yet wise voice, counsel, will be the source of our peace, our delight, and our life, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus, we pray against any evil schemes, mm. And actually, any evil personalities or even thoughts, even mindsets against us, we just pray that don't they will have no effect. Uh, your joy, your wisdom, your love, your 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 living work, and with your living ways, Lord, will be our engagement and our delight, Lord, as you delight in us in our obedience unto you, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm. Mm. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully, Kayla can join in. Um, but we are going to continue today in our study of Second Peter. Um, <clears throat> you know, the Lord's been very timely in throughout the, 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 the couple years that we've been going through the study of the scriptures, um, you know, it's amazing how God is able to to line things up in a certain way. I Many times I'm amazed that, you know, I don't have really far advanced plans, set plans for, you know, I haven't had very far set plans advanced plans for the study yet <clears throat> again and again which is the very nature of spiritual truth anyway <laughs> but it's amazing to see how uh, the um, as I mentioned the, the timing of what the Lord brings forth in our lives and it seems to very directly correlate to the time that we're in uh, spiritually and even in our world, um, that's one of the encouragements that the I think the apostles gave us, especially when it came to the consideration of the scriptures and the words that came through the prophets from God. You know, Peter's going to clarify in this in this letter where do we think that those words came from? Do we think that the prophets were thinking on their own? making up their own course and plan for what the purpose of God was. And, uh, you know, his encouragement is that if, if there is such a word coming from a prophet, well, God's judgment may be on them because that's not the nature of God's word. A prophet doesn't prophesy according to his own will or desire. <clears throat> and um, so God has been very, you know, generous, I think, and, and, and gracious in his dispensation of truth as we have gone through the scriptures. Um, and that, in, in many ways, is the promise of God for those who seek him. Um, that he will be found when he is sought out. That it is his great desire for one of his children to have such a heart to search him out in this way, and that was something that 
was explained as Jesus to the disciples as a delight. He said, blessed art thou, are you. Because the things that the prophets of old, that the kings of old, and even angels have tried to look into and gain understanding in and to, to look into, God has made known to you. And that was not simply, which is not a, a small thing at all, the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Messiah, but an unveiling in the mind and the heart, as Paul would say, of the eternal word of God, the eternal purpose of God, the internal intention of God. What has God been about since the beginning of creation and before then? These things were hidden in the past. You know, bits and pieces came. And Paul even mentioned that even, at his, even as it was being unveiled to him, he said, I still only see in part. But God has designated or ordained a process by which we can see in the whole. And that is God's pleasure to see the veil torn away. To see the separation that has existed between not just between God and man as if there's just a wall there, but he, man had become separated from the purpose for which he was created. Obviously, that was for generations and generations something that God wanted to see restored. And it's the very thing that he promised would be restored from the very beginning. You know, he described the, the enmity between Satan, the serpent, and man, describing that in particular ways, saying that the, the serpent would strike the heel, but, he would cr but, but the seed of Adam, the son of Adam, the promised one would crush his head. And we know this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ as a first level, as a first fruit of what was supposed to be man's destined place in all of creation. So Jesus' fulfillment of that prophetic word that came from God himself about Adam's seed was more, it was not, it was fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but it wasn't completed and will not be completed until, as the Psalms say, his enemy becomes a footstool under his feet. That being his, the rest of his body, the church, the bride of Christ. So this was a, a great revelation that was being made known in and through Christ, being taught to his disciples, and then ultimately how that was going to be done. And how it was going to be done has always been one of the major points of contention for mankind throughout all of history. Because man's vain imaginations that God will do something, in essence, in the same way that man would do something. So throughout the scriptures, we've repeated this time and again, but God says, my ways are not like your ways. That was a very distinct and specific lesson that Peter learned from Jesus through a sharp rebuke. Peter, the way that you're looking at things, as good as you think they are, they are not looking at it from the perspective of what God's interests and plans are. You're thinking of things in the way that man would think of things that the, even if it seems like a noble wisdom, a care and concern for a friend and a rabbi, a teacher and a, and a, a leader, you have a great and deep concern for his life to protect him and to see him saved so that he can become what you want him to become, the king of Israel, the Messiah, 
the Messiah of your own imagination, the Messiah of the traditional imagination of Israel. But Jesus unequivocally says, that's man's interest. It, it's, it's reminiscent, it's, it, it, ha, it contains that idea, contains the echoes of Israel's first cry for a king to Samuel. We want a king like all the other nations have a king. Someone who will lead them into battle and make them a great nation among the peoples of the earth. We want to be like everyone else. But from the very beginning, God said, my people are not like everyone else. Jesus repeated this. He tried to explain that about God's kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. It's not like the kingdoms of this world. Its leadership doesn't function like the leadership in this world does. So Paul and Peter, all the apostles, Jesus himself said, that's not how we oversee. That's not how we lead. We don't lord over. We don't consider ourselves better than others. We lay down our lives. It was this completely upside down idea of what it meant to lead, to guide, to go ahead, to be representative of a kingdom. And to their great surprise, the disciples heard Jesus say things like, to a, a, a Roman centurion receiving this great accolade from Jesus Christ saying, well, this guy has faith. He understands authority. He knows something about the order of the kingdom of God. How, how twisted did that sound to the, to the disciples at the time, who, many of whom, were running in their imaginations of, of how the Messiah would destroy the Roman Empire and put the Jews back in, the, the, the Israelites back in control of the Holy Land. Yet here Jesus is making positive comments about faith and understanding of authority, about kingdom authority, you know, to the enemy. <laughs> Yet these same ideals, because they are not unique to the Jewish people, they are not unique to that time period of history or to the Roman oppression. They are the things that are seated in the hearts of man. And so Peter was a disciple and now an apostle who learned many of these things in a very hard way. But he had learned them, and now he wanted to convey and remind the believers scattered throughout let's pay attention again to what the Word of God is. Let's consider more carefully the words of the prophets, which were not their own. They were given by God and for a purpose. When, when someone, in this case Peter, says, you need to reconsider, the direct implication is the way that you're thinking about something isn't right. So you need to think about it again. Lest we miss, miss the mark. Reconsider means change your mind. Think again. <laughs> A lesson that he learned time and time again with Jesus. But now he has become impassioned for the truth that has now become like a foundation in his own heart and has given him all boldness and confidence to declare it in the days before his own death. 
Last week we touched on, or last session we touched on, you know, Peter's own statements about why he wrote these letters. What his objective was. And then we also touched on some of the highlights of his uh, main points in these letters, and specifically in this one, Second Peter, related to the grace of God, the power of God. What is this power of God? Is it the, the outworking of signs and wonders, gifts, miracles, healings, and the like? Well, that is not the primary nature of God's power. I think mostly those are, those are signs and symbols of God's power, but the true working of the power of God is the transformation of the inner man and the establishment of a way of life, a discipline of life, a wisdom of life. That when it is submitted to those who submit to it and become practitioners of it, thereby become partakers of the divine life. Another strong theme of Peter's teachings and sermons. A life that does not see decay the proclamation of a whole nother source and kind of life that is not like life on the earth. Paul touched on these same things with awe and wonder. He said, I have been crucified. This is Paul. I think in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. Death. Nevertheless, I live. So I have a whole different source of life. And he says, in the life that I now live. So there's a juxtaposition. I'm not living. I don't exist. My heart's not beating. My lungs are not inhaling and exhaling with the same source and power of life. No longer as a, 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 as a just a being of the flesh but one that is born from above. And the life that I now live, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The same Jesus Christ of whom Peter and Paul and the other apostles testified saying, John, we saw, we touched, we spoke with, we witnessed eternal life. We saw the glory of this life. We were firsthand witnesses of it. That carried a twofold purpose in the church and in the truth of what they spoke. One was a testimony that this life actually existed and that it existed in the man Jesus Christ. The other was that this was the life that had been long promised and foretold by the prophets from the ages past. This is the great promise. So that's what Peter was talking about or what he's talking about in these promises here in the first few verses of this letter. Verse 4, he says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises. So the promises are so that through them, through the promises. What was God promising? That we may participate in this divine nature. He says in verse 3, it was a divine power. In last session, we kind of tied things up talking about what this divine power was intended by God to produce in us a particular way or wisdom of life that wasn't just to be practiced by an individual, 
or simply fulfilled only in Christ Jesus, but in Christ Jesus as the first among many. What? Many brothers. So as a family. And that when this way of life, when this wisdom of life was practiced as a family, as a people, specifically as the people of God, citizens of heaven who have been born from above, no longer living and breathing because of the will of a man and a woman to come together and create a child, but one who was born again, born from above, with a life that was sourced from the source of eternal life. When they practice this way of life together, it then becomes and is a culture. Definitive not just of a singular person, but of a people. God calls them his people, his family, citizens of his kingdom. Participators, those who are partakers in his divine life. So then Peter says, then let's make every effort to see the fruits of of that life produced in us. What are those fruits? We touched on them last session. Faith, they give way to another. There's a progressive nature to these. It doesn't mean that you can't have any portion of one without having fully established the other. They all grow together, but they also grow progressively. They give way to one another unto a completion. Paul talks in a similar way in relation to love itself being the greatest gift that God has to give and that which will remain even after all other things have been fulfilled. Paul ultimately said the three most important things are faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of those three is love. Love is a word that has been so far abused in our culture today by Certain definitions. Paul went to some great explanation about what love really is and who really exemplified it and who also commanded his followers, which Peter makes reference to here in the next chapter, as the command of Jesus Christ to love one another. With what kind of love? So here he says, add to your faith this way of life that has been given to you, this hope of life, this promise of life and salvation. Add to it goodness and add to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love, as mentioned before, there's a, uh, can be a, a lot of study on each one of those as a topic. How they give way to one another, how they are produced. We, won't, we will save that potentially for some other time. And continue on with Paul's writing here. He there says in verse 8, For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure... So they are to be that which you are growing in maturity in as an expression of the life of God within you. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What would you imagine ineffective and unproductive to be? Obviously, Peter is not talking here about our pious acts, random acts of kindness, or generosity. But he is talking about this divine life 
being produced in us. And what its product is are these. These, are, these become the fruits, the product of that life, ultimately producing in the midst of the people who practice them a culture. So when we, he ultimately says, well, if we're not seeing this produced as evidence then we don't even know what we're participating in at all. So he says, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to take your calling and ele- make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fail and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, last week, we talked a lot about what Paul was looking forward to and talking about when he was mentioning prophecy. So we have several occasions where he um, he says he's giving a reminder. OK, here's one in chapter one, verse 12. I will always remind you of these things, even though he says you already know them. He also says in chapter three, towards the beginning. Dear friends, this is my second letter I've written both of them as reminders. And here he is also wanting us to reconsider what the prophets have said. I think he mentioned that um, earlier in chapter 1 also. Anyway, he says it here. He says also down in verse 19, we have the word of the prophets made more certain, so a reconfirmation of, was, of, a, of what was given. I'm pointing these out just so that you can see. He's giving them a reminder. He wants them to think about what the prophets said and what it meant and what motivated them to speak it. That's what he's referring to in verse 20. So he says, I think it is right in verse 13 to refresh your memory. <laughs> so he says, as long as I'm alive and I'm not going to be alive that much longer, I want you to be able to remember these things. So look at how many times he mentions remember. He said it there in verse 12. He says it again in 13. He says it again in 15. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will be able to remember these things. And then he talks about his witness. So he talks about being have, being a firsthand witness to the glory and majesty of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. We know that both he and John were firsthand, uh, as Peter, James, and John, that were with Jesus there on the mount. When the Lord spoke from the heavens and said, He says here in verse 17, this is my son whom I love with him. I am well pleased and others uh, in the gospels uh, in the gospel accounts. It says, listen to what he says. We know that for from Peter's perspective. That was another learning moment for him. Peter wanted to to run and build a shrine for them (laughs) in that place. So he was still at that time in a place where he was learning what this divine life was really for. What God's intention was with it. Not standing in the place of of the glory of man, the fame of man, to be known by man in that way. That was the very things that Jesus was tempted with by Satan in the wilderness. Show yourself in this way. We know that through the course of Jesus' ministry on the earth, that there was a little bit of that hope and longing in the the hearts of the disciples. 
even to the extent that in their expectation for Jesus to become this conquering king, they argue with one another to say who would sit at his right hand in the seat of authority in that kingdom. Jesus had to set them straight. That's not the way of my father's kingdom. That's not the essence of God's kingdom. He must become like a little child, the least. But here, Peter declares and gives witness to what he saw. So when he says here, we didn't follow, this is verse 16, cleverly invented stories. When we told you about the power, here's that word again. So Peter's mentioning of power he does in the first chapter, divine power. He talks about participating in the divine nature and that this power of life was given to produce something. And he says, we... We weren't just making anything up. Cleverly devised story is, you know, and he's going to get into this in terms of the false teachers and relate them to the false prophets from the days of old. That they, they have a different idea of what God's purpose in God's kingdom is and how he's going to accomplish it. I think of some of the instances of very sharp disagreement between God's true word and what the prophets of the day said. We can be reminded of the time of Jeremiah when the Babylonian Empire was going to take over. And the Lord told Jeremiah to prophesy very clearly, even in the king's court, that that's what happened. But the prophets that were surrounded the king said, no, that's not what's going to happen. It's easier for us to look at that. Uh, disagreement between the prophetic words and and then in our own perspective say, well, we know Jeremiah was right. But we need to look at the way that the false prophets were thinking. They weren't just quote unquote bad people. They just thought the wrong way about God's purposes. That was the same interactions that Jesus had with the Pharisees that were very, very much a clash. You know, in Jeremiah's time, those prophets thought, well, we have the promises of God. We've had great revival among the people, and God promised. They they read all the promises of God from the prophets in the past and from Moses' law. God said he would protect us. God said this is our land. But they ignored the ways of God. And the practice of those ways in the midst of God's people and what he said would happen if they weren't followed. They ignored that. Well, that's not so different than the false teachers and prophets of of today. They're not considering the culture of God's house. And that that was God's design for for the way in which he would be made known. Jesus said that. They will know you by your love for one another, by the culture and wisdom of life that you carry and practice in your midst. He didn't say they would know you because you preach the right message but because of who you are as a people. Now, I'm not saying that the message doesn't need to be declared and that truth should not be taught. Most certainly it should. But in what context? And by whose authority and sending? Questions that very few in church leadership today ask. Everything is assumed. This is the way God will do such and such. So we go on about our business. It's the very thing that Peter's warning against. 
we need to reconsider this. I'm going to remind you again that in his own time, they didn't understand why, how God was going to do what he would do or even what he was doing, what his real objective is. So he continues, verse 19, we have the word of the prophets made more certain. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. He essentially is saying, focus and try and seek the Lord for understanding along these lines so that the true understanding, the true revelation, the true understanding of the truth eternal truth of God and purpose of God and intention of God is made known to you. And God will make it known to you. What is that prophetic word really pointing to? This divine life, this life of power. And he finishes with the admonition that these prophets were not speaking on their own authority. They, they weren't just speaking the word of God and then interpreting it for themselves. You know, that's a very interesting concept that Peter brings up here because the word of God has not been withheld for many generations, but the interpretation of God's word has been misunderstood by almost every generation. And we live in a day and time when those who claim to have a word from God may have a, a, a portion of truth, but how they interpret it, how they understand it, I mean, how easy is it misunderstood? We need to see those things. When the Lord says there's going to be an ever, everlasting kingdom, uh, 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 kingdom and the assumption of Israel is he's going to come and conquer the Romans and sit on this throne right here, right now. Well, obviously they missed something. Yet we expect that that's different today. When we say, well, we live in the end times and here's how God's going to do such and such and this way and that. And we can't be wrong because we have the word of all the prophets before us. Peter here is saying, well, we got it all wrong and we might want to revisit what the prophet said and wait for the true understanding of what God said he was really doing. So now he continues for most of the rest of this letter, especially throughout, the, 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 throughout chapter two, uh, three, talking about these false prophets and teachers saying how much they've missed it, and he gives us some clues into how we can determine whether they are in truth or not. So he says, there were also false prophets among the people back then, in the same way that there will be false teachers among you. There are going to be those who come and teach the wrong thing, the wrong way. Denying what God has done through Jesus Christ and what he will do in his people. Those who speak in this way, those who interpret God's plans in this way, will bring themselves to a quick end. They will follow their shameful ways, verse 2 he says in chapter 2. And bring the way, so here we have, as we did through the book of Acts, many of Paul's letters, most of the apostles made reference to this life as the way. He calls it here, the way of truth. The way of truth that was taught, even though they did not explicitly declare the words in detail, the way of truth that was taught by the apostles of Jesus Christ was the establishment of, of a culture, a way of life in the midst of God's people. It was not just a message of be saved or you're going to go to hell. It was not a message to the children to say, would you rather 
be in pain and suffering and torture forever and ever, or would you rather go to a place where they serve lollipops and cotton candy every day? The child will always say, we know, and anyone would say, well, I don't want to go through pain and suffering. I want all the good things that I would enjoy because that's what their imagination of what God's fulfillment is, that we just have everything we want. And if you think that's a foolish thing to think, well, a whole generation, generations of people in the past, the Israelites in particular, God's own people were misled thinking that very thing. God's promise to us is that we will have land, we will have a ruler, we will have protection, and we will be blessed with provision and honor. Not seeing that God said his greatest blessing was his life and to know him and his ways and to practice them, to rise above the short-sighted base things of the world. Now, that's exactly what Peter is going to say. When you hear, you will know when you're hearing false teaching because it will be based in that wisdom. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth. So there's a, there's a derailing, a turning away from the way of truth and what God wants really to see produced in the midst of his people. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories that they have made up, specifically re related to God's purposes and how he will accomplish them. God has already condemned them for that. So the angels have their own ideas. We don't know all the details of this, what is behind these statements, but we do know that their Lucifer and many of the angels fell in direct rebellion to what God's plan was for mankind. And God judged them for it. And they were active agents in the deception and misleading a man. We know that by the testimony that we even see in the Garden of Eden in the very early chapters of Genesis. God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for the day of judgment. So he's also moving this letter into the, the where he will finish it, which is with the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, which I want to bring to some clarity around as well. He says, if he did not expect Spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on an ungodly people. He protected Noah. Well, how much is, how much more is he going to protect those who reject this truth? God knows who seek him in the right way. It's righteous. He knows how to protect them. But he also knows how to bring judgment on the unrighteous. Now, verse 10, he says, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature. He's speaking specifically about false teachers. How they speak boldly and arrogantly and without understanding about the order of heaven. The authority that God has given in heaven and on earth, within the context of the angelic realm. I hear it all the time, for many years now. Those who take this pride fall into this very trap that Peter is describing here. Now he continues on a number of occasions to describe what this is, and I want to sum these things up a little bit he basically says if you hear those who are teaching and or preaching talking about a way of life that is basically rooted and seated in the fulfillment of fleshly desire earthly pursuit earthly worldly gain you should know 
You're on the wrong path. And their teaching to you is false. God will judge them. And those who receive and follow after that way will also be judged. He describes them in verse 17 as those who produce nothing. These men are springs without water and mist driven by a storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words. And what are they appealing to? What is their message? What's the enticement of their message? What are they teaching that they're proclaiming as God's will and God's purpose, but it's really appealing to what? The flesh. The lustful desires of the sinful nation, nature. And they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity because they're, they're seeking after that very thing. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it and turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. And a sow that is washed goes back to the wallowing in mud, having been redeemed from the pit, only to return to it. That's the nature of that kind of pursuit in life and this way of false teaching. So as we've read on a couple occasions now, Paul or Peter here is saying, this is why I wrote to you. I don't want you to be misled. And don't imagine that God will not fulfill everything that he said he would do. Verse 2 here, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through our, your apostles. What is God really after? What did he want to see produced in the midst of his people? What is that to mean? To us in our way of life, which ultimately he says, how then should we live knowing that the day of the Lord has come? The day of the Lord here is referenced not to simply the second coming. I mean, people have really many have, have interpreted this to to really directly focus on the second coming of Jesus Christ. But the day, the day of the Lord this great day of judgment is something that God has made reference to from the very beginning through the prophets. Yes, it will coincide with the second coming and physical return of Jesus Christ. But this is the great judgment day. Jesus talked about this day. The great day of reckoning. And there are those who say, well, you know, this is... We've heard this. The prophets have been saying this for generations, but God's never done it. Verse 4, they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, the ancestors and patriarchs of the past, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by the waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. His day did come and his day will come. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. That day will come being kept for the day of judgment 
and destruction of whom? Ungodly men. So he says, don't even imagine time in the way that you typically do. Don't understand time in the way that man understands time. Because God is not slow in keeping his promise, but he is merciful so that everyone might come to repentance. Wow, it just started raining really hard here. <laughs> and he says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. You don't get to plan on that. But we can certainly be prepared for it by our way of life. So he says everything will be destroyed. Everything laid bare. Now he says this in verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? This is like the question of the whole letter. In consideration of my reminders... By my encouragement to consider again what the prophets have said that God's purpose was and is. Through the testimony of what you can see and know to be false teaching and false prophecy. And knowing that the judgment of God is coming. What kind of people ought we be? You ought to live holy, separate, not of this world. Not friends with the world. Whoever is friends with the world cannot be friends with God. Holy, godly lives. As you look forward. Man, this is just such an interesting thing that Peter says here. Because if you think of what the prophets said, to those who look forward to the day of God's coming, to the great day of the Lord. Do you know what that entails? Do you know the plumb line that will be set out in the midst of the peoples in that day? Who can stand in that day of judgment? But Peter said, well, that will be the judgment that comes on the ungodly. So live holy and godly so that you may look forward to the day of God, to the great day of justice and the righteous judgment of God and speed its coming. That day will be terrible, he says. Destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with the promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. The home of righteousness. <coughs> Folks, this day is upon us. And we should look forward to it with the same hope and encouragement that Peter is giving us. It's going to be a, a dark day and a glorious day for God's people. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, <laughs> our encouragement of the day, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Wow. Um, this is what I was talking about when we first started about God's timing in this. You know, here we are in the 10 days of awe between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur, when these very things should be heavily considered in the midst of God's people. Make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Him. And bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Bless God for that. Just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you also with wisdom that God gave him. Now Peter shows us a little bit of, of his own way of understanding and learning. Clearly he is also a student of Paul, gleaning from his teachings and writings. And he gives some encouragement about them. Paul writes in the same way in all his letters. In the same way as what? Not just that he himself writes 
the way he writes, but Peter is saying he has the same message. Speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do other scriptures. Do you see Peter's reference here and what his encouragement was really about through these two letters that he wrote? He is encouraging the Jewish people and the believers of that time. We need to better understand the will of God and the purpose of God. Paul's writings may be hard to understand, but they contain in them the truth and the reality of what God's purpose is. And both he, as we can see, Peter, James, the other apostles, they were laying the foundations for this way of life so that a particular kind of culture could be produced in the midst of God's people. And when you miss it, it's to your own demise. When you deny it, it's to your own destruction. When you turn away from it, you bear the judgment of God. Therefore, dear friends, and we finish this letter, therefore, considering all of these things, since you already know this, here's that reference to the word reminder again, which he has said multiple times throughout this letter. Those must be important things to consider. Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. Remember earlier in 1 Peter, he had said, be on your guard, be self-controlled and alert. 2 Peter 5, 8, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Don't be prideful. But we resist the one who is the resister. He says here again, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men. If there is one thing that defines the culture of today, the day we live in, of this current generation, it is lawlessness. Do not be carried away by that perspective of life, by its protests and demands. Be on your guard. Guard your heart. And on the total opposite end of the spectrum, he says, and he finishes the letter with it, but grow, mature, strengthen yourself. In the grace that is that power from on high which enables you. It's a gift of God. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not just believing who he was and that he lived on the earth. But what did his life mean? What was it for? What did he teach? What were his commands to the people of God? What did he say about God's kingdom and what it was, what it was to produce, what it will be? We need to consider how comprehensive the name of Jesus is. It's not a token. It's not a little totem. It has power. Not by the mentioning of it, but by the, what he says here, the knowledge of who he is, who sent him, for what purpose, and to what end. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. And amen. So that concludes our study on Second Peter.
Amen. And we will, I think we're going to just continue into uh, the writings of John from here, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, um, so that you can have some, some reading, uh, obviously, to, to do for the next week. And we will move into uh, the, the further testimony of uh, John and those, those writings. Bless the Lord. Well, I'm going to have uh, somebody pray to close us. Naomi wanted to come over by the mic and close us in prayer. Yes, Lord, I thank you for this morning, Lord, and what has been shared. Lord, I thank you for, Lord, just your purpose, Lord, for your people. Lord, I pray that we would just, Lord, think on these things, Lord. Lord, ask you for, Lord, understanding. Lord, I pray that we would, Lord, put down our own lives, Lord, and bring up your life on this earth, Lord, to share to others, Lord, and live in the right way, Lord, that you have, Lord, set out for us. Lord, I thank you for my dad, Lord, and Lord, his heart to share for you, Lord. And I pray that you would just continue to, Lord, speak to each one of us. Mm. And we would continue every day to seek you, Lord, with the right heart and mind. Lord, I pray that you would just bless each one who has, who is here, Lord, and who will listen. Lord, I pray this in your name. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Kayla. We didn't get to say hi to you this morning, so glad you glad you made it on. Me too. <laughs> we're gonna see face, am I? Uh, we can't hear you, bro. You're cutting in and out again. <laughs> Kayla, I think he was saying that we're going to see you guys soon. You guys are coming out this way, I think. Yeah, I'm excited. We talk about it. Almost every day. Do you? <laughs> you guys are driving up, yeah? Yeah, we talk about, like, when we're going to Washington, when we do that, we should do this and this and this. And we can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> well, that's a long drive. But we're glad you're coming to see us. So, Well, bless you guys. Bless you, Elaine. Brother Emmanuel, we will be talking soon. Yeah.